OK, thanks very much. Right, well, I'm going to um, just change the pace a little bit and talk about uh, getting down, getting dirty, uh, nuts and bolts of um, sorts of systems. We're all thinking along the same lines, it seems to me, today. A lot in the room have been talking about soil carbon and thinking about soil carbon. Uh, what uh, preoccupies my time is working out ways that are practical, that we can actually try to put carbon into the soils in the current environment we've got, with the current tools we've got, the current systems that we've got. Because the current system that we are utilising in, uh, in conventional agriculture doesn't address this at all. So we spend our time trying to work out ways to do just that. Um, I haven't got all the answers, but these are some, some uh, interesting things to look at, perhaps. I've called it Terra Carbonicum Maxima, the Latin for maximising soil carbon, and also that's my young fellow needs a bit of a terror. <laughs> Food producers control big picture stuff. Just one slide on that. Food producers control the largest carbon sink over which we have control. And I think that's something that we've got to put in context, that <coughs> all the land that, it, that farmers own and control and, and farm year by year, it's the biggest carbon sink. So we, as farmers, we actually have the power to to have an influence, and a big one. In broad acre terms, I'm talking uh, cereals predominantly, wheat, barley, oats, and some canola. That's the wheat growing districts of, of Australia, covers 22 million hectares. So that's the footprint that we've got that we can actually influence um, in this country. When we're looking at uh, farmers' role in this uh, carbon sequestration, wanting to take carbon out of the air and all that, the farmers are where the, r the rubber meets the road. It's, uh, if we want to utilise that soil uh, to, leverage so to leverage carbon sequestration outcomes, we need to understand what farmers need because that's where the, 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 the rubber meets the road with government policy and carbon outcomes. If we want to use the soil, we've got to understand what farmers need. Why do we need to, to, um, to engage farmers? Well, they've got skin in the game. You know? They're actually out there in the paddocks every day. They're inherently practical people. By the nature of the game, they have to be practical, and we need some practical outcomes. So we need to engage this type of thinking. And the main thing is that soil carbon is important to their business anyway, because we need, as, as uh, Ashani said this morning, we need to have soil carbon building in our soils because we get agronomic outcomes. We saw the, the demonstration with the peds of soil. <coughs> we get better soil structure, more water holding capacity, better fertility. We can grow better crops. We can make more money. It's a business decision to put more carbon in the soil. There's some confusion about uh, soil carbon sequestration in the community at large, I believe. Uh, talking to city people and talking to uh, bushies right out west, if you uh, get up every morning, you're on the coast and you go surfing every day and hear about this sequestration, you might think it has something to do with a, a sea animal. Um, if, you, if you're right out west, a ringer on a station, um, on a big cattle run, you might, have, might think it's something to do with sea castration. Sorry for all the men in the audience for that slide. It's got nothing to do with that. It's got to do with taking carbon dioxide out of the air, putting it into the soil. That's what we want to do. There's other ways of putting carbon in the soil. We can uh, plant a heap of trees and lock it up. Uh, we can make biochar. We can make compost, put it in the soil. They're all novel ways of doing it. I don't think they have a lot of practical application uh, in broad acre agriculture. There's got a, the methods we need to adopt need to satisfy these four points, I believe. The first three, support food security. That's number one. We've got, we just heard, we've got a big population to feed. Until we understand how we're going to grow more food for less, we need to actually, every, every step we make, we need to be able to support that food security outcome. So locking up valuable land and putting it under trees and things like that is probably not going to satisfy that outcome. It needs to be practical. There needs to be, have agronomic outcomes. It needs to be economical, it needs to be a business decision. From the farmer's point of view, it needs to be a business decision. Why do we need those three top points to, to take place? Because it needs to be adoptable over a large area of land. It can't be some novel little way that 20 hectares it w seems to work, you get more carbon if you do A, B and C. It needs something that every grower can actually go, well, I would adopt that because it's cheap, it's economical, it's got agronomic outcomes, and um, it's a business decision. So it needs to be adoptable over a large area to have any meaningful change. This is a slide I ch uh, stole off Tony. He doesn't know it, but he knows it now. Um, <coughs> use some soil carbon building principles from, from other systems we know work. You saw from Tony's uh, work this morning. Um, 
and they're having a lot of success in, in uh, managing these perennial grass systems in actually storing carbon. It's a really successful way to put carbon in the soil. But in our cropping systems, we're growing annual plants. Until we can work out how to grow a lot of food uh, with perennial plants, until we come up with perennial wheat or something like that, we're stuck with an annual system in most of that uh, 22 million hectares on that picture you saw of Australia. So there might be some things that we can, we can steal out of this that we might be able to use in our annual systems. And why that system actually works well, why it's putting carbon in the soil, is because you can see the, uh, the picture on the, the, the plant on the right has a massive root system. It's putting a lot of carbon in the soil. It actually swings the soil into being more fungal dominated. There's more fungi there. And I'll explain later why that's important. And they, they're a host for mycorrhizae fungi. So there's all these sorts of things that we might be able to steal for annual plants uh, from this type of system. So basically the, the fundamentals, and there's not too many people in the room wouldn't understand what's going on here, but you're, you're dragging carbon dioxide out of the air through photosynthesis and pumping it underground. It's a carbon pump. And we're interested in what's happening with that carbon, that carbon pool in exudates, in root biomass, in uh, microbial exudates, all those sorts of things. What's actually happening there and how do we keep it there? Because there's a prodigious amount of carbon actually being pumped into the soil every year by our plants and there's a prodigious amount of carbon that leaves the soil in that cycling thing and our job as, as growers is to try to uh, capture more of that carbon under the soil. So we need to understand what's going on uh, to be able to capture that carbon. And in my mind, and there might be more, but I think there's five basic carbon pathways in, in, in the soil that we can use um, to, uh, to get carbon into the soil. Uh, one is we can fertilise for, for larger roots. And currently, um, conventional growers would say we already do that. We use uh, superphosphate and MAP, monoammonium phosphate and things, to get a root response. But we can do other things that don't have a carbon footprint uh, like those products. That can, this, in this case, this is just a bacteria that was sprayed onto the plant and we invariably get a larger set of roots where we use this organism, growth-promoting rhizobacter, they're called. We can use my mycorrhizae fungi. Now, these organisms are of great interest, interest to us because they produce this, that, that stuff that's uh, globbing off that hyphae there. That's a fungal hyphae. Um, that's a, a, a material called glomalin, which is a long-lived sort of carbon in the soil. So we can utilise that on our plants and we can manipulate that, and I'll go into that um, a bit more. We, number three, we can manage crop residues. Now, what we mean by that is to, is to actually get them to break down, to degrade in the soil using biology, and in particular using saprophytic fungi. And you can see that picture of an old cotton stalk there with fungi wrapped all around it that fungi is actually sequestering carbon and actually increasing aggregate stability that holds onto the carbon, and I'll go into that in a minute. Number four is we can employ fertiliser technologies with lower carbon footprints, with lower inherent energy needs to, to manufacture them. And they're the sort of things we've been playing with. Number five is don't lose it in the first place, and there's heaps of really good work being done in Australian agriculture over the last 10 years on just this very thing of how we stop, uh, at least stop losing the carbon in our soil. Conservation farming, it's called, and it's very successful. This bloke uh, on, the, uh, on the left there retaining his stubbles, using uh, disc machines, getting not, not disturbing the soil too much so the carbon can't leak out of there, whereas the old ploughing technology, it's, it's ancient technology, we should leave it behind. So we'll just flesh that out a little bit more. Number one, Big roots, just some, dem just some examples of some roots and what we can do to actually increase root growth. Something we've been playing with for the last few years is a thing called liquid injection at planting. And we put um, um, a, a liquid stream underneath the plant when we put the seed in the ground. And what that does is it allows the fertiliser to wick out into the soil where the seed's going to germinate. And everywhere that young root grows, it gets exposed to a fertiliser effect and we invariably get a bigger set of roots. And we're putting down all sorts of things that inspire bigger roots. Um, that's just a couple of pictures there of uh, with and without ones, uh, with uh, just normal uh, granular technology versus a liquid inject uh, technology, just increasing that root biomass. By physically putting more carbon in the soil will be, is the outcome of getting bigger uh, root biomass. 
So here, here's a, a replica trial, won't bore you with too many slides, but we've got a 30% increase in using a biological liquid injection system versus um, the straight old technology of, of monoammonium phosphate. So the monoammonium phosphate, yes, it's getting bigger roots, but we can grow bigger roots than that by using something with much, much less phosphorus um, by tweaking things, uh, biological things mainly, um, around the root system. Um, here's one we did in a pot trial. We got 63% increase in root biomass um, over, the, over the MAP. So we can get, we, we've proven that we can actually get a bigger root response by manipulating soil biology around the root zone um, than, we, uh, than we can with con conventional fertilisers. Very simple to set up on machinery, just a tube running back of, around the back of the tine there, you can see, um, dribbling into the soil. Um, and uh, inoculating that soil with all sorts of things that stimulate root growth, root hormones, microbes, um, mycorrhizae, fungi, uh, little bits of nutrient, all sorts of things. Very easy and cheap to set up and uh, adopt. Um, growth promoting rhizobacter, we do a lot with uh, bacteria. Um, we work with a doctor at the moment that's uh, um, very good at isolating wild harvesting uh, strains out of our cropping belt and finding the ones that have the biggest influence on root biomass and phosphorus release in the soil. And uh, we ferment them up and squirt them down the tube um, at sowing time, so we inoculate that plant with these sorts of organisms. And what they're doing, you can see that picture is a root hair, and there's little um, bacteria on the end of it, and every second that's uh, passing, those bacteria are exuding uh, root uh, growth-promoting hormones, so that plant's constantly being stimulated um, by that bacteria. Um, that's a trial we did early this year, showing uh, the, uh, the one on the right there, obviously, is the plant growth promoting rhizobacter uh, response. And you can see down the bottom how small those wheat plants are um, in that trial. They're only little babies, and look at the mass of, of root that that's pouring into the soil. And that, that's the sort of outcome we're looking for. We want as big a root biomass as we can. A, because it's putting carbon in the soil, but B, it's a great agronomic response too, result rather. We want to have bigger roots. We want to be able to source more nutrients from the soil, source more uh, moisture from the soil, give us that resilience in our crops. So when it gets dry, we've got spring just around the corner. Hopefully it's a soft one, but more often than not, through the cropping belt, we get uh, wickedly uh, hard springs. And if you've got a big set of roots, agronomically, you might actually get that crop over the line to, to a harvestable um, result. So it's an agronomic result. Uh, there's uh, Dr. Ayer. Um, he's the microbiologist we're working with. And a picture of a trial we're doing this year up at Canamble. A couple of good growers. Um, wheat and pea roots. Um, here, pictures. The one on the right is uh, inoculated with this thing called mycorrhizae fungi that I showed you a picture of before. They actually inspire the plant to uh, have a bigger set of roots as well. Um, there's one, I think that's of a uh, strawberry plant. But you can see the, the VAM, vesicular arbuscular mycorrhizae fungi. They always produce a bigger set of roots. So we've got ways that we can actually influence root biomass with our agronomy with a low carbon footprint. Uh, that's it in corn. Um, this is in peas this year at Forbes. And you can see that's, that's purely liquid inject. There's, there's no granular high input um, carbon footprint materials used there. And you can see the size of those roots on those little pea seedlings. <coughs> what that might mean uh, coming into spring is, is going to be pretty valuable. Glomalin production. This is the real neat stuff that mycorrhizae fungi exude um, out there uh, from their hyphae. You can see in that picture there you've got, uh, it's actually of a pine seedling, it's quite a famous picture that. Um, but uh, you can see the root system there and the fuzzy bit that's hanging off the root is actually the mycorrhizae fungus. They're a mutualistic, um, a symbiotic rather, uh, organism. They, they need to have a host and they uh, get nutrients uh, from the soil and uh, give it to the give it the plant and they're also um, making this stuff called glomalin. That's a root hair. You can see how fine their filaments are and they stretch out away from the root and they gra gather up zinc and phosphorus, calcium, nitrogen, all the nutrients the plant needs and, uh, and absorbs it up for the plant and helps the plant along. So agronomically, big tick. We really want these things on our plants. <coughs> they also produce this beautiful stuff called glomalin and up to 20% in the literature, it varies from somewhere around 8% to 20% that I've been able to find um, of the exudates of the plant or the, or the net photosynthate of the plant, how much carbon that plant's making from uh, photosynthesis each day, 
can actually go down through that hyphae network system and get pumped out into the soil as this long-lived material called glomalin. It's a very sticky material. Um, it's a, a glycoprotein, so it's very sticky, and it binds the soil together and gives this thing called aggregate stability. Now, there's only one word that you remember from this talk. I want you to remember aggregate stability, because that's what it's all about, is manipulating the ability of the soil to do this, to actually wrap around soil particles and hold in the carbon that's being pumped in the soil from the plant. So as, as I said, there's a prodigious amount being pumped in. You just got to work out tricks of the trade to, to not let it get back out. And creating aggregate stability is the way you do that, is trapping that carbon in there. And that's what mycorrhizae fungi do beautifully. Here's a, um, a graph just showing that. I don't want to bore you with too many graphs, as I said, but um, on the uh, upward axis, you see water stable aggregates. And um, on the x-axis, you see uh, the hyphal uh, length, so the amount of mycorrhizae fungi, and it's a linear relationship. The more hyphae fungi you've got, the more mycorrhizae hyphae you've got, the more uh, s aggregate stability you've got. Uh, this is the same sort of graph except done with measuring glomalin, the, the stuff that the fungi put out. Um, increase in water stable aggregates versus uh, glomalin uh, content. So it's a linear relationship that we can we can use agronomically. These things make spores um, and we have uh, labs now in Australia, this is Dr Ash Martin from down the Adelaide lab that measures all our mycorrhizae fungus for us. We can track it through time, we can track it across paddocks, we can uh, track different uh, application methods and different strategies to try to manipulate things. So we're, we're starting to actually measure these things and quantify them and, and try to make sense of it. Uh, this is our <coughs> grower group. Um, last year we got everyone to do mycorrhizal tests and trying to make sense of it across paddocks and across systems. Um, and these are some of the things that we're doing to try to impact on them. There's, there's some really neat technologies coming out now that allow us to actually manipulate uh, mycorrhizal uh, fungus, this one here um, that's moving there, that's a, what they call a signal molecule. It actually um, locks into the spore and triggers that spore to wake up and to germinate. So it means that it gives us the power to be able to uh, coordinate um, a, a, a germination of the mycorrhizal spore at the same time as we're uh, putting the seed in the ground. So we can synchronise mycorrhizal colonisation at the same time as our plants um, are put in the ground. So um, we've got uh, access to really good technologies in uh, growing mycorrhizal spores. Um, prices come right down in um, just uh, literally in the last uh, 12 months that we can actually uh, economically inoculate our plants with mycorrhizal spores. And down the bottom picture of bacteria, um, there's some bacteria that are called mycorrhizal helper bacteria that actually um, encourage the mycorrhizae to form association with the plant. And um, in this case, they're also phosphorus solubilizing bacteria, so we utilize them for both reasons. Uh, this is um, close to home down at uh, North Parks Mines where they do um, a few thousand acres of cropping and they do a lot of trial work there for the community. Um, we were involved in one last year where we were actually able to measure this. It's uh, conventional fertiliser, the acidic phosphorus fertiliser versus control versus what we call our soil sequest system, basically a liquid inject system with mycorrhizae fungi and phosphorus solubilising bacteria and those sorts of things in it. And we're able to show um, very clearly we've got a 20% colonisation, so 20% of those plants are actually colonised by this really neat fungus we want. Um, we were able to double that with um, using our strategies of um, inoculation and so on um, versus the MAP that actually um, nails that fungus, just nails it to the wall. You get a 2.5% colonisation. So the conventional system we're using is, is not encouraging these sorts of organisms at all, and these are the very organisms we need to sequest carbon in our soils. So our current systems aren't the right ones uh, for what we're trying to do, and we're trying to work out ways that we can do it better. Number three is digestion by, uh, by fungi. Um, I'll be quick with this one. I've run out of time, I can see. Basically, it's just uh, these saprophytic fungi. Quite often, uh, you can see them. Uh, sometimes they're, they're too small to see, uh, microscopic, but uh, the bigger ones you can actually visible see, visibly see, as in this one. Um, very obvious when you've got them. Um, however, we seldom see them in uh, cropping paddocks. The interesting thing is we can actually manipulate uh, these organisms as well and using 
uh, things like the signal molecule technology that triggers these spores to wake up at certain times so we can put our trash on the ground, signal these fungi to wake up and we get a flush of saprophytic fungi that are binding all these, uh, breaking down the cellulose and binding all the soil pits together and creating this, what's the word? You weren't listening. Thank you. <coughs> so that's what they do. Break down cellulose, lignin, produce complex carbon compounds, rec recalcitrant, uh, which means long-lived uh, carbon compounds. They stabilise or trap organic carbon. They manufacture soil glues for greater aggregate stability. Don't forget that word. There's uh, one of the top growers down at Forbes. Um, he's uh, one of the few in his little district there that actually retained his stubble. They all said he was mad. You're never going to get through it. You're going to have trouble. Why don't you just buy a packet of matches? They're only 50 cents at Woolworths, <coughs> which a lot of people did. But that's two and a half tonnes of carbon energy going up in smoke. And that, that flame is that, that's burning energy that we're seeing there. And instead of that energy going up in the atmosphere and all the, the CO2 loss and all the rest of it, that's actually energy that could drive the biological system because fungi, bacteria, all the organisms need calories to, to, to live. And uh, if we burn it and put it up in the atmosphere, they haven't got that energy to actually go about their processes of creating aggregate stability. Okay, employ low carbon footprint technologies. Um, this is a very quick one. Uh, there's only one company that I know at the moment that creates a microbial product that's actually gone through the whole process and officially measured their carbon footprint, but it's vastly different. You can see um, it's a little uh, vial that does five hectares and um, it costs bugger all to make. They just ferment it up and freeze dry it. And uh, if you compare it to uh, currently uh, uh, use of urea, um, they've done this on uh, um, uh, 70 tonnes of uh, carbon of, of urea, you can so you can see so say a thousand hectares worth of um, of urea in that truck up the top, and there's a thousand hectares uh, in that uh, little box down the bottom. So very much smaller, not, no transport costs. Comparatively, 280 carbon equivalents per hectare in 70 kilos per hectare of urea um, costs about the same amount of uh, energy to make a kilo of steel as it does to make a kilo of urea. In context. So 280 carbon equivalents versus 3.4 carbon equivalents for the microbial option. So there's, there's people out there starting to measure these things and we could, it'd be quite easy to put together a, a picture of um, low carbon footprint technologies in fertiliser technology that we currently have available now that would look something like that. It'd be much lower than the conventional system and that's what we're looking at. In rough terms, if you were to get... Um, uh, half a tonne per hectare of extra root biomass, that's really achievable uh, from the calculations we've been working with, measuring root biomass and how much weight of roots that we're getting. Uh, Glomalin, trapped lobile seed, the numbers vary um, a lot in the literature, but say if you were to come up with roughly half a tonne, digested stubble another half tonne, so that's one and a half tonnes of carbon per hectare you could feasibly get by adopting a certain um, um, uh, more up-to-date fertiliser strategies um, as opposed to using old, uh, old strategies. Um, and then if you would add to that the carbon equivalent offsets, you're gaining about 281 carbon dioxide equivalents um, that potentially if trading ever came in you could use as offsets. <coughs> so incremental gains add up to, um, this is just dummied up, they're not real figures, but it's just to show over the seasons that you can increase carbon and carbon can dive down again as it's been in that natural cycle that uh, we talked about this morning. But as long as you're gradually and incrementally going up over time, that thing of compound interest, um, you actually do get somewhere with soil carbon. We're doing a five-year trial on these sorts of things with the CMA um, at Forbes at the moment. Um, you can see on the right is um, our biological treatments versus the, uh, the standard conventional treatment on the left with uh, some chemistry and so on. Um, so uh, that's going to be going for five years. We'll be measuring soil carbon and we're measuring shore biology and trying to work out uh, the relationships of these things. That's uh, just taken the other day and um, it's, uh, we're about um, two, two and a half uh, growth stages ahead of the MAP at the moment. So the system agronomically ticks the boxes. We've actually got an agronomic system that is 
is, is working, is giving outcomes, bigger roots, more resilience to our crops, biological outcomes, carbon outcomes, carbon footprint outcomes, versus a system that um, is probably 1950s technology and probably needs to be updated sometime pretty soon. Thank you very much.